Welcome back. We're finally done talking to people, and now we can look around the museum and the various exhibits it has. And fortunately, in this act, we are not under time pressure, so we can actually look around at our leisure. Uh, where else can we go? We came from here. We can either go north or west. Let's go up here first. Ooh. In the words of John Hammond, we've got a T-Rex. It's a Tyrannosaurus Rex. His name is Rex. Isn't that clever? Not particularly. This room contains a marvelous dinosaur exhibit. Indeed, it does. This room... This room... A fine painting of a mighty brontosaurus, the Thunder Lizard. This huge creature with its tiny brain is currently the subject of a controversy. Dr. Earl Douglas from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History believes that current brontosaurus displays have the wrong heads mounted on their skeletons. However, Dr. Oth Neil Marsh, who originally discovered the brontosaurus, believes that the heads on current displays are correct. Only time and more fossil evidence will conclusively prove which of these esteemed gentlemen is correct. Hmm. I actually don't off the top of my head remember which of those ended up being correct. I'm sure a simple Google search would uh, reveal that answer, however. Not going to do that during the video, obviously. There's also a bone here. A sign on this dinosaur bone display says, Please touch. Either these bones feel lonely, or the museum wants you to learn more about the bones by coming into close personal contact with them. I think the latter is more likely than lonely bones. The bone is fossilized and dusty. That seems obvious. Let's touch it. You pick it up and place it in your purse. Uh, okay. I think when it said, please touch, it didn't mean take with you. Oh well. The thigh bone from a young Tyrannosaurus Rex who no longer has any need for it. True. Still doesn't mean we should just, you know, take it with us. But I guess we did, and there's nothing we can do about it. I sincerely doubt you can put it back. While this is an interesting approach, it serves no practical purpose. Nope, we have a bone now. A small sign identifies this dinosaur as an iguanodon, which means iguana tooth. However, from the Tyrannosaurus rex's point of view, this dinosaur could be identified as dinner. That is kind of how they're set up, I guess. What's this? Some kind of plaque about the T-Rex? Just read what it says. The sign says, push button to hear Rex speak. Yes, because famously dinosaurs could talk. Welcome to the Leindecker Museum Dinosaur Display. My name is Rex, and I'd like to tell you about myself. I'm a type of dinosaur known as Tyrannosaurus Rex, which means King of the Tyrant Lizards. Although I was not the largest type of dinosaur, I was the largest predator ever to walk the Earth. Some of my friends were 40 feet long and weighed eight tons, with teeth that were six inches long. Your modern elephants don't weigh more than six tons. I lived between 250 and 65 million years ago, during a period known as the Age of Dinosaurs, also called the Mesozoic Era. 
the first complete skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus Rex was found just 24 years ago in Montana in 1902. Although there were many meat-eating dinosaurs, I was considered the best killing machine who ever lived. Speaking of which, I'm feeling a bit hungry. Would you like to volunteer to be my next meal? <laughs> uh, no thanks. Obviously another voice role from Josh Mandel there. It looks like an admirable reconstruction of fake leathery reptile skin. Good to know. It looks like... I was hoping you could look at its teeth, but no. An iguanodon, up close and personal. It's an oil painting. Alright, nothing else interesting here, I guess. And no other exits, so we have to go back the way we came. Let's check to the left here. Looks like we found a bunch of old armors. Um, nothing's happening when I click there. Alright, no description for the room at all. Let's look at the armors. An Italian suit of armor circa 1470. The plates are skillfully modeled. The helmet is of a type known as a salad, introduced in Italy and Germany. The salad helmet was elongated and pointed in the rear, normally worn with a neck and face defense called a mentonnier. The mentonnier's lower section was fastened to the breastplate and protected the neck while the hinged upper part cupped high enough to protect the chin, nose and cheekbones. Okay, I'm sure that's important to somebody somewhere. A house pet, tastefully prepared for battle in 16th century armor. Poor doggy. The armor of Gallio de Jean Rilac, 1465-1546, distinguished member of one of the great feudal families of France, who served as a warrior under Charles VIII and was master of artillery for Louis XII and Francis I. The structural features of the Jean Rilac armor, dated 1527, indicate that it was made by an armorer who knew every trick of the art. The helmet and colleton offered complete protection for the head, and every surface is curved to deflect arrow, lance and sword. The helmet also has vision slits, ample for sight yet narrow enough to prevent a weapon from entering. The helmet is reinforced with a forehead plate and a rondelle in the nape of the neck, a weak spot in the human anatomy. Well, that's more than I ever wanted to know about armor. The armor of Alessandro Farnese, Duke of Parma, circa 1570. It was made by Lucio Piccinino, master armorer of the Renaissance. Elaborately decorated, this fine suit was presented to Archduke Ferdinand of the Tyrol in 1579, who kept it at Castle Ambras. I would not blame you at all if you skipped this part of the video. <laughs> Surviving examples of 14th century armor are rare. This armor is from Chalcis, circa 1400, showing a decorative fabric covering riveted to the plates. It has a fine globose brigandine with a deep skirt built of large shaped plates. Of course, for those of you who somehow care, I will still look at all of them. After all, something might be important. A fine example of Maximilian armor, made in Germany in 1505. The steel has a characteristic silvery color. Maximilian armor was first used in Milan, which set the fashion for all Europe in matters of dress and armor. You know, I remember complaining in the Colonel's Bequest that there weren't enough custom descriptions for things to look at. I think they went a bit overboard in this one. Then again, that is kind of Josh Mandel's signature, isn't it? The suit of armor is empty. 
Oh, that's different. And interesting. Something to keep in mind for later that this suit of armor is empty. The suit of Can't see what kind of armor it is, I guess. The armor of Anne de Montmorency, Constable of France, worn at the Battle of San Quentin on August 10, 1577. Thin and comparatively light, 50 pounds, it was worn by a man of 64 years, which was quite old for that time. This armor is a three-quarters fighting suit. Its illustrious occupant met his death at the Siege of Saint-Denis in 1567, at which time the armor came into the possession of the first Earl of Pembroke, who led the English knights into battle. That is pretty old for back then, yeah. Maximilian Armour, Germany, circa 1514. Made for a man about 6 feet 4 inches tall, with a chest measurement of 54 inches. Knights came in all sizes, and some suits of armour were for knights 7 feet tall. Wow, those must have been Dutch knights. The helmet on this Italian suit of armour, circa 1460, is interesting because it's a barboot, which lacked protection for the lower part of the face. The barboot is sometimes called the barboot salet because, like the 15th century salet, it doesn't enclose the whole head, offering most of its protection to the top. Unlike the barboot, however, the salet is often characterized by a reinforced forehead plate and an elongated pivoted nape defense. It is, however, difficult to differentiate between the barboot, the salet, and the bassinet. The shallow barboot resembles the salet, while the deep barboot resembles the bassinet. Then again, who really cares? Um, getting a little bit self-aware there, game. Um, there's also a chest here. An empty chest from the 15th century. Although the carvings on the exterior are crude, Cut into the wood by someone with little talent or ability for wood carving, the chest now resides in a museum, simply because it's old. Kind of makes you stop and think, doesn't it? It does. Wait, does it? The chest feels like wood, and you get a small splinter in your finger when you rub your hand over the carvings. I was hoping to see if anything was in it, but I guess it's not. There is a painting here. A painting of the Black Prince as a Fierce Baby by Ed Botticelli, circa 1560. The cheap wood frame is by the Lion Decker Museum, circa 1925. <laughs> don't touch it. You don't know where it's been. All right. There's a tapestry here. A rare 17th century English tapestry which tells the story of Teutonic warrior cockroaches that crossed into England from Germany and besieged the castle of Rochford on Essex. Although the cockroaches managed to storm the castle walls after a 90-day siege, the knights of the castle managed to squash the invaders when they reached the castle's inner keep. Since that great battle, the castle of Rochford on Essex has been free of cockroaches. Unfortunately, it has also been free of humans. One year after the great battle, everyone in the castle died of the plague. Shortly afterward, the castle fell into disrepair and sank into the swamp. That sounds like a truly epic tale. Oh! Looks like we can actually hide behind this tapestry. Interesting. That sounds like something we might want to keep in mind in case we ever need to spy on someone here. Can we talk to any of these armors? You get no response. Nope. <laughs> Unsurprising. No times. Even though it's Josh Mandel, still not Space Quest. Uh, let's see, there's also a bunch of flags here. A heraldic flag of the late 12th century decorated with fleur-de-lis. 
Flags existed well before the development of heraldry, but by the time that heraldry was becoming systematized, some flags were so large that they were mounted on wagons in order to be displayed and transported. That seems unwieldy. The first banner of the Earl of Scarborough Fair, the upper portion of which is decorated with sprigs of parsley, sage, rosemary and thyme. Their family motto was Muris Aeneas Conscientia Fana, which translates to a found conscience is a wall of brass. Don't ask what it means. It is occasionally hard to tell what parts of this are true and which are just supposed to be jokes. I think this is a joke. The banner of the Earl of Roslyn, who placed the following Latin motto over his family crest, Eleso Lumine Solem, which means, View with sight unhurt the meridian sun. After he wrote the motto for his banner, the Earl of Roslyn went blind from staring at the sun too much. Sure. The banner of the Earl of After This is one of several flags of the Baron of Winchelsea on Avon, who could never make up his mind which banner he preferred. Their family motto was Nil Consciere Sibi, which translates into English as Conscious of no guilt. Apparently, they were only guilty when they were unconscious. <laughs> sure. This is one of several flags. Apparent. This unique banner, which belonged to the Earl of Cholmondeley, bears the motto Virtus Tutissima Cafis, which means Virtue is the surest helmet. Unfortunately, the Earl didn't live very long after he came up with this motto. He lost his mind when a common foot soldier kicked him in the head after he fell off his horse. He was wearing full plate armor, except for his helmet. His friends had warned him about not wearing a helmet, but the Earl was known to be quite headstrong. Addled by the blow to his head, the Earl walked straight into the River Thames. Since plate armor doesn't float very well, the Earl of Cholmondeley immediately sank to the bottom of the river and was never seen again. In fact, he's probably still there. Some of these descriptions are like my favorite part of the game. Do all of these guys just have a fate that is ironic compared to their motto? The Earl of Carlisle's motto at the top of this flag reads, Volo non valeo, which means willing but not able. Uh, of what? This striped heraldic banner belonged to Sir Orr Derbes, the French Baron of Beef. His family motto on the upper part of his banner was Or de Combat, which, although it sounded fierce, actually meant out of the battle. This was not a family known for its fierce warriors, although it did produce several excellent interior designers. <laughs> sure, I'll believe that. Okay, that's everything in this room, I think. A round periwinkle blue window of a type often called a rose window. That's kind of in the distance. Uh, we can go either north or south. Let's do south first. And it's a basketball court, judging by the lines on the floor. Looks can be deceiving. No description of that, Look, unfortunately. This is the life mask exhibit. You haven't seen this many dead-looking expressionless faces since your accounting class at the university. Badoomch. It's life masks, apparently. This is the life... And we can look at some of these masks. This appears to be the head of an Eskimo. You wonder if they really do use every part of a seal. Um, I guess they do. The head looks like that of a North American Plains Indian. You've read many exciting stories about the American Indian. If you read those stories in the dime novel, I wouldn't believe them. This head is French-Canadian. You wonder if French-Canadians are anything like Creoles and Cajuns. 
Well, they are French, I guess. This is the life mask. This, 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 he this head from Greenland somewhat resembles the head from Alaska. Sometimes difficult to actually click on the head. The Panamanian head looks a little worried. I wonder why. Maybe because it's dead. The South American head has strong, regular features. This is... This... The head is from Brazil. It reminds you of your great-aunt Marjorie, who went to Brazil to treat her brain fever and never came back. Maybe it's her. Seems unlikely, but still. Let's move on to Europe. This head is from England. You ponder whether or not he always looked so grim. If he's from England, probably yes. This... 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 Come on. This, this head is from Arabia. Your thoughts are suddenly filled with tales of the Arabian Nights. Like Aladdin. This person lived off the Ivory Coast. How exciting! I'm sure. This head is from the Cape region of Africa. This is... This... 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 I am not getting this one. Okay, I think I'm about to give up here. Yeah, no, I can't look at that one. This head is from the Cape region. This, 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 this. This isn't annoying this, or anything. This, this, this head is from the Mozambique area of Africa. How exotic. I guess so. This, this, this head is from Arabia. We saw that one. This head is from India. You close your eyes, smelling the incense, hearing the temple bells. Have you been to India? Seems unlikely. At this time... This... 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 Exciting gameplay here. Me trying to find the right spot to click. Alright, moving on. The plaque says that this is the missing link. Well, he's hardly missing if he's right here on the wall. Can't argue with that logic. This is the plaque says. This is the the plaque says it's the head of an Australian Aborigine. He looks elemental and wise. This this it's the head. All right, there's some heads on this side too. It's the head of a crow manyon man. My, how people have changed. Indeed they have, compared to it's that. It's the head of an Australopithecus man. Poor little fellow. The plaque says there were animal tooth marks in his skull. No guesses on how he died, then. This is the... This... Can't, I guess you can't look on those two. This is... This... It's the head of a Ramapithecus man. And? The head is from Mongolia. You've heard that the Mongols would have taken over the world if their ponies' legs hadn't been so short. Seems believable. This is the head of a smeltdown man. You've heard rumors that smeltdown man just may be a hoax. Was it? Not sure. This... Alright, that's enough life masks. What's to the north here? Ooh, more armor and flags. I'm sure that's just what you were waiting for. Chelsea's armor circa 1400. This specimen is unique since surviving examples of 14th century armor are quite rare. It seems to be guarding the door. Ooh, must be something important in this door. It's an unmarked wood door with faded flecks of white paint on it. The door is locked. When you touch the doorknob, you get a heavy coating of dust all over the palm of your hand. 
I guess that door is not used very often, then. On close inspection of the door, you see two heavily faded words that were painted on the door at eye level, although some of the letters in the words are totally unreadable. E M space L space Y E space S O space space Y. Um. Not sure what that's supposed to be about. It's the traditional sort of hinged transom that can be opened and closed for ventilation. It seems to have a lot of dust on it, as if it hasn't been used in a long time. I guess so. Maximilian armor from Germany, circa 1514. Very impressive. The armor of Anne de Montmorency, Constable of France, worn at the Battle of San Quentin in 1577. Oh, uh, we actually saw that description in the other room. The battle flag of the Earl of Roslyn. The battle flag of the Viscount Maynard. One of the battle flags of the Baron of Bath, who changed his family motto several times. Translated from the Latin, some of his early mottos were Take a bath, we enjoy a hot bath, we need a bath, and don't forget to wash behind your ears. After 30 years of indecision, the Bath family finally decided on You need a bath, which declared their view of how much the king needed the support of their family. Sounds likely. One of the battle flags of the Baron of Winchelsea on Avon, whose family motto was conscious of no guilt. Nobody trusted him. One of the battle flags... All right. Moving on. Ah, now this looks more interesting. We finally found the Egyptian exhibit. This is part of the ancient Egypt exhibit. Which means the dagger must have been here somewhere. Let's see if we can find out where. The placard says, This is a granite steel depicting Horus and Thoth, found in the temple of Amun-Ra. This steel was modified during the reign of the pharaoh Akhenaten, then restored during the reign of Tutankhamun. I guess it's talking sepulchral about this. sepulchral steel found in a tomb of the 6th dynasty. It tells the story of Una, born during the reign of King Tita, who served under Tita's successor Pepi. Una died during the reign of King Morena, full of days and honor. An Egyptian-style pillar. Indeed. And an Egyptian-style window. This is the Uruach T. A winged solar disk with two Uri, the goddess Nekhabit on the right and Buto on the left. According to one myth, Horus assumed the form of the solar disk to protect himself from the evil god Set. A sturdy window that looks out on the city of New York. Wow, ancient Egypt even had had windows looking out onto New York. Wait, probably not. This is a granite steel depicting Horus and Thoth, found in the Temple of Amun-Ra. This steel was modified during the reign of the pharaoh, Akhenaten, then restored during the reign of Tutankhamun. Wait, so I guess this note was talking about this display? That seems weird. A pyramid, albeit a tiny one. This pyramid is a model of the Great Pyramid of Cheops, Khufu, as it appears today. Originally, the entire surface of the pyramid was covered with smooth, polished limestone. This covering has worn away over time to reveal the stepped surface we see now. The base of the Great Pyramid covers 13 acres and was built with over 2 million stones to a height of 480 feet. Construction took 30 to 50 years. Oh, it's only a model. How about this guy? The mummified corpse of Amenophis III, also known as Amenhotep III, or Memnon by the Greeks, 
he built large temples to Amon-Ra, both at Karnak and at Luxor. In the fifth year of his reign, Amenophis marched into Nubia to quell a mighty rebellion. He also ruled over the Mesopotamians, since his kingdom was quite large. We also know that Amenophis was a mighty hunter who slew 102 lions during the first 10 years of his reign in his spare time. Now he's dead. Indeed he is. And what's this? It looks remarkably like a glass case in the shape of a pyramid. A small card informs you that this case contained the famous Dagger of Amon-Ra, which is now missing. Aha! So this is where it was, but obviously is no more. It looks remarkable. I can't look at the sign, I guess. Might be worth inspecting that more closely. Although there are a few scratches on the glass case, there are no signs of forced entry into the display. There aren't even any fingerprints. That is what Detective O'Reilly told us. Kind of peculiar, I guess. Can we look inside the display? Oops! Congratulations! You've cracked the case of the Dagger of Amon-Ra. I guess we did. That's not entirely how I intended to do that, though. Don't touch the sharp pieces of glass. You might cut yourself. Good advice. Well, on that disappointment, I guess, we'll continue in the next video.